He said it's fine, I'll send you his letters. <laughs> oh, I connect with him, with everybody. Um, so we've been on the theme of grace, and I just want to very briefly recap last week. When we talked about, you know, struggling into the new covenant, really, and I was talking about our struggle with legalism and our struggle with license. Right, and, and, and we, I use the two images of legalism being like a cage that we put ourselves back at, under. When we, when we live under the law, when we live under the covenant, the, the old covenant, we, we end up putting ourselves back into the cage. The ticking the boxes, I need to do this, I need to be made like that, I need to, you know, I haven't read my Bible enough, I haven't done this enough. And, and it's this, this, He's brought this voice inside, right, that is always condemning and accusing and trying to measure up to, to what we believe God wants us to be. And then on the other side, we had, you know, way over here, we, we find ourselves falling sometimes into the swamp of license, right? Well, you know, it's okay to be a Christian and watch Game of Thrones. It's okay to be a Christian and, you know, get drunk every now and again. It's okay to be a Christian and gossip and slander about other people and brand them. Right? Like, we find ourselves dabbling in this swampy place, right? Where Jesus says, I have come to set you free. And that's the liberty of the new covenant. Amen. And, and we, we find that we struggle to to always stay on this path where the Spirit and the Son and the Father are leading us and guiding us into liberty, into true freedom. And so this week we are actually going to be taking a, a deep dive into the terms of the new covenant. What are, what are the terms of what is this new covenant? And you know, as I've said before, I have so enjoyed doing this series. I hope you have enjoyed it too. Um, but it's, it's been reviving my heart. It's been reminding me about my faith and, and, and this covenant that we live in. And today we're going to just take this deep breath and then you'll be encouraged. As I think we have been encouraged just preparing this and preparing these scriptures. And so we are going to be spending quite a bit of time in... Um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31 and 32, if you want to get your Bibles out and uh, get to, to uh, those passages, and then we're going to be sharing our time. So Robert's going to come up and do the next part. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's uh, always very fun of speaking there. So, uh, yeah, but it's an honor. It's really an honor. And uh, in terms of the new covenant, and just as Inga was speaking, I'm reminded again that we actually are in that covenant. Does anybody remember what a covenant is? It's kind of like a contract. And uh, I know I've said that again and again and again. But we, we forget about that. You know, our relationship with God, it's not a contract. Okay, It's, it's a hard contract. People think of a contract as like a legal document, you know? Like if you don't do this, if you don't do that, you're out. And that's really what a covenant is, right? And let me stick to my notes. <laughs> so here's the simple, here's the simple day, message today. Do we actually know what the terms of the new covenant are? Do we actually know what what we are under in a new covenant, right? What are what are the what are the aspects of this? heart engagement we have with Jesus and with God the Father. Here's the simple message, Hebrews 8 verse 7. You want to turn that right? If there had been, this is what Hebrews 8 verse 7 is about, if there had, and this is Paul talking, speaking, writing, if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, the first covenant being the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, if there had been nothing wrong with it, there would have been no need for a second one. Right? There would be no need for it. 
It's a simple, clear, irrefutable statement. Right? It's a simple statement. Yeah, the first covenant was, there were, were shortfalls. The shortfall was not God, but the shortfall was us, humanity. We couldn't keep the terms of that covenant. Couldn't keep it. Galatians 2 verse 21, I'm going to, I'm rattling off these scriptures, eh? But they're just such, they're like, they're just such <laughs> solid scriptures. Are you guys with me? They're just solid. Just simple truths. <clears throat> He says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If we, if we could have attained righteousness through the first, through the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic law, right, there would have been no, there would have been no need for Christ. And so now we're under the Christ came, and so now we're under the new covenant. And so here's the Hebrews 8 verse 9. Behold the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And so God here declares that we are, you know, He's going to bring days but he's going to establish a new covenant with the house of Israel. And so he's speaking of the, ter- of the time now where we're under this new covenant. Not a covenant made like the old covenant when he took them out of Egypt. Not like that covenant, but a new covenant. A new and improved, a new and a better covenant. And so what, what did the Lord do for us? Really? What does the Lord do for us? It prepares us for this good news, right? The good news of the coming of Jesus. And so we remember that God's intention was always for the new covenant. Even from the time of Abraham, God's intention then and his plan then was for us to be under a new covenant, to be brought into relationship with him through Jesus. Right from the beginning, that was his plan actually, right? And so we don't ignore the law, set the law aside, but we actually, it prepares us, right? It prepares us for that good news. And so even the Mosaic covenant, there was the Abrahamic covenant, there was the Mosaic covenant, now there's a new covenant. The Mosaic covenant actually never did away with the Abrahamic covenant. It stood alongside the Abrahamic covenant to fully show humanity our sin condition, our inability to keep that. Right? To keep that contract with God and our need for the new. Yeah. Galatians 3 verse 8. Right? I'm going to move on. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. He says, this is what God said to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So that those who rely on faith are blessed alongside with Abraham, the man of faith. And so the law was our guardian, almost like our guardian, our, our preparation until the time that Christ came. And so these terms of the of the of the new covenant were prophesied some six hundred years earlier by two major Old Testament prophets. Eh? Yeah, does anybody know what these new terms are? And so this is where Jeremiah comes in, okay? <coughs> Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. If you guys want to turn there. So the Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. This is exactly what, he's, what he wrote, what Paul wrote. In Hebrews, right? He's actually just quoted it verse for verse in Hebrews. Although I was like a husband to them, a husband, eh? He's a husband to a bride. And there's that relationship again. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. 
I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbor to know the Lord, Lord, because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. It's massive. It's huge. I, the Lord, have, the Lord, have spoken. And so here, God announces these terms to us here. It's really simple stuff, eh? But he, he just declares it. He announces it. I'm going to bring it to you. And so here, these are the terms. There's forgiveness in this. Do we accept this, though? No. He says, He offers forgiveness. But he, he doesn't offer, just offer forgiveness. He says, I will no longer remember their sins. You know? And so we come to God and we say, well, God, forgive me, but do we? I, I find it difficult to you know, accept the fact that God actually forgets my sin. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. He forgets it. There's not only forgiveness, but there's, he's, there's forgetting it. Right? That's the one part of the covenant. It's our guarantee. The second terms of the covenant is our guarantee of our relationship with the living God, not specifically written in scripture in, in context of covenant. The terms of relationship and our relationship is vested in covenant. In covenant with Jesus, we are then in a personal relationship with him. Right? And this is like a it's, a, it's a personal, it's a deep relationship. It's, it's, it's right at our core, right? It's, <laughs> it's emotional. For me, it's an emotional relationship that I have with God. It's not just like, a, it's not just head knowledge, it's, it's heart knowledge, you know? And just as the scripture says, you know, God writes his law on our hearts. And so we can call him other, we can call him daddy. It's a personal relationship, intimate. And, and Jesus calls us his friend. It's something to be excited about, eh? Yeah. If nobody's getting excited that much, well, yeah, you guys can get excited, eh? You know, it's, it's intimate. It's not, <laughs> it's not a law-based thing. It's, it's an emotional connection with God. And I, and I pray for each one of us here today that we, we have that, right? That we, we're not under law, but we're under grace. You know, I just want to Push it all aside, and push all the rules aside, and all the rules of church and all the rules of religion. But we have that deep personal relationship with Jesus, right? He longs for us and we long for him. That's the that's the nature of our relationship. That's the nature of our new covenant with him. Yeah. So yeah, I think you're gonna Expand on it some more, right? Eh? Some better rooms. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's just amazing just listening to that, right? And just like actually let our hearts take it in. Like really, like not just in our minds, like in our hearts, receiving that. These amazing terms, this amazing promise. This covenant, this everlasting covenant, he talks about. And I will have an everlasting covenant, never to be broken again, never to be, you know, we, we, you know, we messed up, you know, but this is the covenant that keeps us forever, into eternity, <coughs> in relationship with God. It's just amazing, amazing. So Robert touched on the terms being forgiveness. How we get to call him daddy or abba. And, and that sometimes that's difficult for us to even comprehend that. Some of us have not had a good relationship with our daddy, our father, our earthly fathers, right? Some have not even had a father present. But God uses himself with the person of, of other 
to, to draw us into deeper intimacy with Him. And allowing that friendship with the Son to, to, to really um, draw us deeper and deeper into Himself. The terms also talk of us belonging to each other, God to us, and us to God in Ezekiel 36, 38. He's wholeheartedly given himself to us through his son. And he causes us to keep the terms of the new covenant. He causes us to be righteous, right? Like I love that song. I think we all just felt the, the presence of the Holy Spirit around. Lord, we need you. We need you. You are our righteousness. Our one defense. Our righteousness. So beautiful. So the promises here, we're going to look at Jeremiah 32. And I really encourage you to just take Jeremiah 31 and 32 this week. And just meditate on these scriptures. Isn't it amazing? So here in the story of Jeremiah, all these chapters, right in the middle there somewhere, God puts this covenant. The first the first um, glimpse, so to say, right, of the new covenant, of the everlasting covenant, was prophesied 600 years before Christ. Isn't it? Doesn't that just intrigue you? How God works? <coughs> God of mystery and wonder. You know, here he speaks to this one prophet who is not a very popular guy, right? And he, and he says, let me tell you something. There's more coming. There is a, a mystery that, that nobody knows about yet. And I'm going to share it with you, and you are going to write it down, and this will forever. You know, it, it's Jesus comes, in a sense. God takes his son, Jesus, and he sweeps across the street, right? I love it back and forth, sweeping through the street. And we see that sweeping of God. And that's why I love reading the Old Testament and discovering Jesus right there in the Old Testament. It's a continual story that goes on and on. So let's read Jeremiah 32, verse 38 to 42. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action. So that they will always fear me, and that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. What is this everlasting covenant? I will never stop doing good to them, and I will inspire them to fear me, so that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing good to them. And will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. That this is what the Lord says, as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will give them all the prosperity that I have promised them. And and I want us to just look at this, taking this this incredible truth, this the reality of this overwhelming grace that's been extended to us. And to make it personal, take this page home this week and meditate on what, what this means for you, for me personally. Number one, and I've put we and then I've put I, I will belong to God. I will belong to Him. Number two, He will never stop doing good to me. And for me, he will never stop doing good to me and for me. A promise that he will fill me with reverential respect for him. The fear of the Lord. Reverential, reverential respect. Amazing. He will never turn away from me. No matter what I do, no matter how stubborn I am, no matter how rebellious I am at times, no matter how, you know, difficult I am or 
just running from him, he says he will never turn away. He will always woo you, right? His love is so deep, so high, so deep, so wide. Like we sing those songs. <laughs> but do we really receive that in our hearts for ourselves and for others? <clears throat> and he says, and I will never turn away from him. He will cause that we, our hearts, will always be able to be wooed back, right? And isn't that just true? Like we go through times when we just feel far from the Lord, where he's not speaking, where he's not, doesn't feel close, where we're struggling, where we feel numb, or we feel distant, or we feel distracted by the world. He says, I will never turn away from you. And I will cause you not to turn away because I have a covenant relationship that will last forever and ever. And number five, he rejoices and delights in doing me good. It actually brings pleasure to his heart to take care of us, to do good for us. Is this not the good news? Do people not need to know this and hear this? Not a God that is condemning and accusing and a taskmaster who's saying, you better live up to these, these rules, these laws. So there is nothing of the old in the new. We said that right in the beginning, right? No. We've repeated it again and again. There is nothing of the old covenant in the new covenant. Nothing. And I had my colleague at YFC, it was so funny, it was in a different context, but I, as I was preparing, I was thinking about it, giving this visual. He said it's like wearing, you know, two skis, you know. One ski in the covenant and, and, and in the old covenant and one ski in the in the new covenant, you know, and you're trying to ski. And the pole comes up, you know, and you're gonna you're gonna straddle that pole, right? You're gonna you're gonna be knocked out there if that's how you live. It just equals disaster, right? We cannot have one foot in the old covenant and one in the new. That is a kind of, that is in living like that, Paul says, is a covenant of condemnation and death. Another interesting visual that, that I found this week, which was amazing. So in Exodus, I'll give you the reference if you want to look that up. In Exodus 32, verse 28, look at these two, two verses. Exodus 32, 28, and Acts 2, 41. We find that under the law, okay, under the law, these, these Israelites were just messing up, they were just not keeping the law. Moses was doing his best, he was trying to talk with God, and he comes down the mountain, and they messed up, and what happened? 3,000 Israelites were killed, right? I read this, I was like, holy oh, smokes. 3,000. He comes down the mountain with the tablets. They've messed up. They've disobeyed God. And, and 3,000 Israelites die. But in Acts 2, we find that the Holy Spirit comes. And what happens on the day near, near Mount Zion is that 3,000 salvations happen. Sure. Isn't that incredible? Death and life. Death under the old covenant and life under the new covenant. And the same number of people, just about. Huh. I just found that, I just found that wild. I never really realized that, thought about that connection. So what are the terms, the bottom line of the terms is this. 
Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. He is the covenant. Him and him alone. So what is our purpose then? What is, what is our response to him? Two words that are very easy to say and very difficult to live by. You want to take a guess at it? Two words. One starts with an S. Surrender. 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 He says that's all. That's yep. all you need to do. To to live fully under this new covenant. It's just surrender. Hmm. Wow. And the other is trust. Surrender and trust. Very easy to say and very challenging to live by. Mm. Laying down our rights, laying down our will. It, 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 it requires us to continually be changed right from the inside. That's why we're never done with the Lord. It's an everlasting covenant, so it's an everlasting relationship. A continual relationship. We go from glory to glory. We are changed from the inside as we surrender, as we trust God, as we read His Word and we make it our own. We take these promises and we speak them over our lives. Declare it over your lives. Out loud. Take these pages and speak it out. I made Robert speak out something the other day like a yeah. self-proclaiming, not a self-proclaiming, just, I said, Robert, say it out loud, out loud. I deserve this from the Lord. We struggle to say it, so we're going to have Nathan. But we need to. Speak it out. Speak life over yourself. Melanie was making us do that on Friday as well. Speak life. Speak healing. Speak joy. Speak salvation in your family. You know, we, 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 we do this, you know. One ski here, one ski there, you know. No. We cannot live like that. That is not the everlasting covenant that he has invited us into. Sure. The worship team can come up and we're going to just spend some more time just, just being before the Lord with us, right? Maybe you need to just sit there and, and pray this promise, speak these promises out. <coughs> Maybe the Lord wants you to receive it for the first time. Maybe you never really received the promise, the terms. Maybe you never agreed to the terms of the new covenant for yourself, truly. And there's maybe areas where you still feel you're stuck in the law. So, Richard, you can come up and I'm going to pray for you.